All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, that way you never miss out on future critical care content such as this video here. Now, in this lesson here today, we're going to be taking a look at a very important medication when it comes to certain emergent clotting situations that our patients might find themselves in. It is a very powerful medication but also one that can be easily confused for other medications as well, which I'm going to talk about in this lesson here. So let's go ahead and get started talking about out the place. All right, so this quick lesson here is going to be well-timed as I just released the final lesson in the ACLS review series where I talked about our acute coronary syndrome and our stroke algorithms. And so Altaplace, also known as RTPA, is a complex medication with some potentially serious side effects, and it will warrant a deeper dive in a future lesson where I talk a little bit more in depth about some of our thrombolytics. But to start things off, let's actually talk about what is RTPA. In order to do this, we have to start talking about what TPA is. And TPA basically is tissue plasminogen activator. And this is actually a naturally occurring protein in the endothelial cells of our blood vessels, and it plays a really important role in the breakdown of clots. And so RTPA, that this stands for recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, and really what this means is that this is basically just a production of TPA using a recombinant DNA technique. So it's our way of artificially creating TPA. Now RTPA is classified as a thrombolytic, meaning that its job is to lyse clots or thrombi in acute or emergent situations. Now the medication itself goes by the name Altaplace, with a trade name of either Activase or Cathloactivase. Now it is going to be very imperative that you distinguish Altaplace from two other similar sounding and similarly used medications. Those medications are Retivase, also known as Retiplace, and TNCase, also known as Tenectoplace. Now these other medications are both also forms of RTPA. And unfortunately, the term TPA is often used to refer to all of these medications and even more importantly to ensure that the proper medication is being ordered and used for the proper situation as they aren't all used for the same purpose. All right, so let's move on and actually talk about how it is that RTPA actually works. Now, in order to understand how Altaplace works, we need to look at the clotting process and specifically the lysis of a clot. And so I'm going to draw a clot here. And then without going too deep, the basics are that the tissue plasminogen activator, both the natural and our synthetic RTPA, catalyze the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. And we can find this plasminogen either bound to the clot or floating freely in the systemic circulation. Now once we have plasmin, this actually works to break down many blood plasma proteins, and specifically for our purpose, it's gonna break the crosslinks between the fibrin molecules. It's these crosslinks that are what provide structure to our blood clot, and thus breaking these down leads to the breakdown of clots. Now, one of the nice things is RTPA is actually quite selective for the clot-bound plasminogen, but to some degree it can and does bind to free plasminogen, which then produces free plasmin, which can actually lead to systemic lysis. And one other important thing to know is that the older the clot is, the more fibrin crosslinks that there are, and the less effective that RTPA is going to be. So now let's actually talk about some of the side effects that we can get for using this medication. The first and most common with this medication is going to be bleeding. And this can be either our GI bleeds, our GU bleeds, uh, this can lead to bruising, nosebleeds, and even bleeding gums for our patients. Other side effects they may experience would be things like nausea, vomiting, dizziness, hypotension, mild fever, and they can have allergic reactions like swelling, hives, rash, etc. Now, there are also some potentially serious adverse effects that we need to know, and a lot of them are going to be related to that bleeding. So, in our neurologic, we are worried about cerebral hemorrhage. 
in our cardiovascular system, we're worried about things such as arrhythmias. Uh, this can also lead to cholesterol embolization as well as venous thrombosis. In our gastrointestinal system, we are worried about bleeding, the GI bleeds. As far as our hematologic, uh, obviously we're worried about systemic bleeding, and then we are potentially at risk for anaphylaxis. All right, so now let's move on and talk about the different uses that we have for this medication in critical care. And there's actually four primary uses. The first one is going to be for our acute ischemic stroke. Now, Altaplace or Activase is the only medication that we have approved by the FDA for its use in acute ischemic stroke. Retaplace and Tenecteplase are not approved for this specific use. Now, in order to be a candidate for RTPA, two conditions must exist. First, the patient does not have a hemorrhagic stroke as confirmed by getting a head CT. RTPA is indicated for strokes caused by occlusive emboli. Obviously, we don't want to give a thrombolytic to someone already with an intracranial hemorrhage. And then the second condition is that the patient's time of symptom onset or the time of their last known normal is within the window to give. Now, typically this window is going to be within three hours, but we do have expanded versions of this window that go out up to four and a half hours, um, but this does exclude some patient populations. Now, our dose here when we're giving it for stroke is going to be 0.9 milligrams per kilogram, and this is going to be an IV infusion over one hour with 10% of that dose given as a bolus within the first minute. Our max dose here is going to be 90 milligrams. Now, during the infusion, as well as for several hours after the administration, a very close monitoring of the patient's neurologic condition is going to be warranted, uh, specifically looking for deterioration in that condition or signs of intracranial bleeding. Now, also to prevent the increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage, tight blood pressure goals are going to need to be maintained, often keeping our systolic blood pressure less than 180, with an ideal goal of around 140 to 150. All right, so our next potential use is going to be for myocardial infarction. Now, as mentioned, the earlier from symptoms that it's given, the more effective it's going to be. And really, for this case, it's probably going to be ineffective if we give it more than 12 hours out. But when we are using it for this purpose here, there's actually two ways in which we can give the medication for an acute MI. We have an accelerated infusion, and then we have a three-hour infusion. The accelerated infusion is our preferred method. So for the accelerated infusion, if their weight is greater than or equal to 67 kilograms, then we're going to give them 15 milligrams as an IV bolus over one to two minutes. From there, we're going to follow up another 50 milligrams over 30 minutes, and then we're going to give the final 35 milligrams over an hour for a total dose of 100 milligrams. Now, if their weight is less than 67 kilograms, then again, we're still going to start with a 15 milligram bolus. Then we're going to give them 0.75 milligrams per kilogram over 30 minutes, and then 0.5 milligrams per kilogram over 60 minutes. Now, for the three-hour infusion, so here if our patient's weight is greater than or equal to 65 kilograms, we're going to give them a 100 milligram IV infusion over three hours. And typically the way we'll do this is 6 to 10 milligram bolus, then 50 to 54 milligrams the first hour, and then 20 milligrams, and then another 20 milligrams for the last two hours. If they weigh less than 65 kilograms, we're going to start with a 0 0.075 milligram per kilogram bolus, give them 0 0.675 milligrams per kilogram for the first hour, and then 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram for each of the last two hours. So as you can see, definitely a different type of dosing when we're using it for MI versus for stroke. So now let's actually move on and talk about our next use, which is going to be in the cases of acute massive PE. Now, our use in the case of massive pulmonary embolism is really going to be dependent on what is going on with the patient. So first, if we have a patient who is experiencing hemodynamic compromise, then we do have recommendations that come from the American Heart Association, and they recommend giving 100 milligrams IV, uh, and this infusion should run over about two hours. The other situation would be for our patients who are in cardiac arrest as a result of their PE. And unfortunately, there isn't really a clear consensus or definitive guidelines for its use in cardiac arrest. Now, the most common use in the most recent literature seems to be giving 50 milligrams IV push during the arrest with the potential use of a second dose 
uh, if they are either persistently hemodynamically unstable, uh, a recurrent arrest happens, or at this point we've really failed to achieve ROSC. And then finally, on to the last reason in which we would be using this, and this is going to be to restore flow in our central lines. Now, this isn't technically a critical care only use, but it is something that we often are and will be using for our patients. And so essentially, if we have one of the lumen on our central lines that doesn't aspirate blood and is beginning to occlude, then we can use the cath flow activase to attempt to clear that line. And basically, the dosing works like this. There is a 2 milligram and 2 ml dose that we're going to infuse into the occluded line using a 10 ml syringe. When we infuse it in there, we want to let that sit, let that dwell for 30 minutes. Then we want to check if it's functional and aspirates blood. If it doesn't, we want to continue to let that activase dwell in that line for an additional 90 minutes, giving us a total of 120 minutes of dwell time. And then again, we want to check if it's functional and aspirates. Once again, if it still does not, then we can infuse an additional 2 milligram dose and repeat this process. Now, if its function is restored, then we do want to aspirate 4 to 5 mLs of blood to remove any residual cath flow uh, as well as any residual clot, and then follow that up with a good 10 mL flush. All right, so those are our different uses for RTPA in the critical care environment, and overall a pretty quick flyby review of this medication. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please leave me a like down below. It really goes a long way to help support this channel in the eyes of the YouTube algorithm, as well as leave me a comment. I love to read your guys' comments, and I try to respond to just about everybody. Also, make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and then share this lesson with anybody else you think might find it useful as well. Special shout out to our awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. Uh, again, your support is greatly appreciated. And then make sure and stay tuned for the next lesson that I release in this series. Otherwise, check out a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.